So I can't see the recording button now. I think it's on, isn't it? Yes, I, it is. A little record button there. Yeah. So uh, here you go, Paul. I'm going to show you this little presentation that I've just done uh, now. It's essentially, as I said, it's a uh, it's an it's an audit of all the NHS choose and book patients that I see uh, who are um, coming to me the uninsured patients, which is about a fifth of all my patients. Um, and my son's put this amazing bit of software together, which shows me um, uh, on word searches, uh, the demographics of my patients, basically. And I haven't been able to do that before now, but I, I've basically been able to search for these keywords by diagnosis, for example, tendon, arthritis, carpal tunnel, and by instrument for guitar, piano, violin. And we've been able to search for words like violinist or pianist, which of course doesn't have an O in it. So we've managed to get around that and tendonitis, tendinitis and tendonitis. We searched for all those in misspellings, et cetera, and things like steroid injections, hand therapy, surgery. And all of these things are, um, uh, they're unusual words. So they don't come up in normal conversations. So if they're in the letter, it means that we've considered that. And then the investigations I've done for them as well. So we can actually do some graphs of those things. So basically this is what I've just found out. So I've had 621 patients uh, of whom 242 are musicians. So that's 39% of my patients in the last four years. Um, and I've been looking at my new to follow-up ratio. That is the number of follow-up appointments that patients get, because I suspected that maybe musicians had more follow-up appointments before they were discharged follow-ups for every uh, patient compared to 2.42 for non-musicians. So that's not too bad. Um, but I think musicians are very keen when they are better not to be discharged because it's quite difficult to get back in the clinic and they think if they've got a problem again, they'd be quite keen to, to be seen again. So they, they'd make a six month appointment even though they haven't got any clinical problem. And so mm -hmm. discharging them is more difficult. And this is what I found that um, I've got about 50 guitarists, um, a lot more pianists, and a lot of people, this includes people um, with second instruments and third instruments, etc. So quite a lot of people would have a second instrument of being a piano. I think that's why that's come up so high on the list. Mm. How many cellists there are. And harp is definitely disproportionately represented as well, um, given how many harpists there aren't in the world. Um, and those are the instruments, the string instruments, as you can see, are strongly represented there uh, as turning up in hand clinics. And then we had a little look to see whether uh, patients were musicians or not musicians by age. And what that shows, uh, I don't know if you can see that here, but essentially, if somebody's a musician, it shows blue on here, and more than half, or about half of the patients are in the younger groups mm -hmm. are musicians, and in the older groups, it's it's mostly non-musicians. And so I think it's a, it's a slightly younger demographic is what that's saying. Uh, and these are the conditions that people have. So the, in this one, the musicians are showing up as, as the sort of orange red color. Um, and pretty much the conditions they have are the same as other people in similar proportions. There might be a little bit more uh, um, uh, ganglion in non-musicians and uh, there's a little bit of variation, but generally it's it's pretty evenly divided between musicians and non-musicians. The tests that I do, no conduction studies, MRI and ultrasound, I've done lots of those and fairly evenly spread between the musicians and the non-musicians. And these are the treatment pathways, largely steroids and hand therapy. And again, even proportions between musicians and non-musicians. Decompression procedures for tendons, trigger finger and carpal tunnels and things like that. And general anesthetics and local anesthetics uh, represent neck, elbow, again all fairly evenly distributed between musicians and non-musicians and then I searched by um, instrument by specific conditions just to see if say guitarists got carpal tunnel syndrome more often than other people and if you look at all 621 patients including the non-musicians you see that the overall incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome is about 25 percent in my clinic it's the commonest condition I see guitarists slightly more pianists slightly more than the average and violin and cello slightly less, but I don't know that that's statistically significant. So again, it's more or less in the ballpark. Arthritis, I thought would be interesting to see whether guitarists got arthritis in uh, greater numbers or pianists got arthritis greater than others. And overall, I'm 7% of my patients, seven to 8% of my patients having arthritis mentioned in their letter. Uh, piano, slightly higher at 10%, uh, guitar, 7.8%, uh, so generally not very different to the rest of the population. The word tendon uh, being mentioned 
again, around 50% of our letters contain, contain the word tendon, and it's not much higher in guitarists or pianists. So that's a brief little summary of what I'm up to so far with the, analyzing my, my work. So musicians get similar conditions as everybody else, but what I do find in the clinic is that actually it affects them much more adversely, even with milder forms of each of those conditions. Um, and uh, the investigations are sometimes normal because the severity is mild and it's below the threshold for most musicians. And then the diagnosis becomes difficult. You've got to use your clinical skills to uh, try to come up with um, a diagnosis, maybe using steroid injections or asking a hand therapist to put them through some probiana two if they uh, aren't playing in public anymore. Um, and then they become a tubiana one if they can barely practice and a tubiana zero uh, if they can't play at all. Tubiana was a Parisian surgeon in the 1970s in Paris who started this musician hand thing. And, and all of those things happen. Uh, musicians slide down that scale very quickly, even with the slightest degree of any of those conditions that we've talked about. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, um, and, then, and then of course, to make them better, you've got to be very gentle with it because often it isn't a very bad degree of the disease process. Um, and you've got to find a little nudge to make them better. So surgery is not commonly considered. It's mostly things like steroid injections, hand therapy, splinting, advice, ergonometrics. And that's where, that's where you come in. And as we've talked about before, it's that bringing together of hand therapist and hand surgeon and technique educator uh, that's so valuable for this special group of patients. Yeah, there's one thing that I certainly have noticed um, over the last two decades, and that is that certainly amongst guitarists, um, and I wonder whether you think this is coming amongst other musicians, is that they wait quite a long time before they seek help. And obviously that becomes an issue in terms of, of recovery and so on. Do you think that is the case still? Um, uh, I think it has been the case in the past, certainly. Uh, I, I think the threshold is dropping a little bit. I think one of the reasons that people, musicians tend to hold off a lot is they're frightened that, that the surgeon will take over, do some horrific thing to them and be career limiting. Uh, and and that fear has been uh, addressed a little bit by a BAPAM, who are often the first point of contact, being reassuring and then letting them know that basically people like me and you and uh, hand therapists uh, are now familiar with the conditions that they have and find fairly harmless ways of making them better. Um, things that are unlikely to injure them or make them worse. Um, and uh, that that we're basically a lot gentler with, with musicians now than we used to be, I think. So I think that word is getting out there. And so people are presenting earlier and coming with pathology, which is a little easier to correct. I'd say that's mm -hmm. true. Do you think now that we obviously have the internet and so on, do you think that when the musicians are coming to seeing you, do you think they already have a better understanding of, first of all, what you may be able to, to do for them, but also maybe what they might, suffer from or do you think that actually the internet is the opposite it creates misconceptions and so on uh I, the patients have often googled stuff uh they're not that well informed uh, um and that's okay and some patients come very well informed um my work and and actually there's still a lot that i can do for them when they come to the clinic there's still an awful lot of education um realistic uh, advice that i can give them so i wouldn't I'd, yeah I think I think many of them are overwhelmed by the amount of information that's available on the internet, and I think I can help to deal with that when they come to me, um, and help to sort out some of the information that they've got a vague handle on. So, um, uh, yeah, they're they're better informed in many ways than they used to be, um, because I've been in this twenty years like you have, um, uh, but they uh, they're a bit muddled, um, and and it just needs a bit of crystallizing, which I think helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been very fortunate, never have had to um, have any hand treatment, but are you able to explain sort of, if a, a guitarist came to see you, depending obviously on, on, on the issues that they're presenting with, but what could they expect to happen sort of in a, in a consultation with you? Um, so, uh, well, basically the standard clinical consultation that we do with BAPAM is about 40 minutes as a video consultation. And if somebody sees me for a new patient consultation, it's, it's half an hour. And in that time, I'll crack through all the usual things. So it'll be basically taking a careful history, which usually takes 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and then a clinical examination, which usually takes about another 10 minutes. 
and then a discussion of the treatment plan and the investigative pathway. And usually in the first visit, it's simply an investigative pathway, which would be some nerve conduction studies, MRI, ultrasound, as we discussed. Um, it might be a referral onto a hand therapist, and then I'd get their opinion as to what they think their working diagnosis is going to be. And one of the other outputs, as you know, is, is that I often suggest to people that they have a session with you and I on Zoom, and, uh, and then we can find technique workarounds that may help them not to change their technique, particularly to suggest that their technique was wrong in the first place and may have caused the condition, but just to say that given this condition that they now have, is there a way that we can make their technique uh, different uh, that'll work around the clinical problem? Yeah, uh, and I know that, uh, Mark, you were talking about some very specific conditions. I wonder whether we could talk about those today. Yeah, we'll, we'll put them in a separate video. What do you think? Yes, why not? Yeah. Let me stop recording now and uh, we'll put them in a separate video.